addressing a seminar today, uh, and it's given by a team at Florence Dunkel of Plant Sciences and Plant Pathology, and many of you know her for her insect banquets and also for her great work internationally in Africa and, uh, and also with uh, local Native American groups um, talking about uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, we have Cliff Montaigne, retired professor of LRES, who's been involved in holistic, sustainable land management around the world for many, many years. And then we have Jason Baldus, who's a graduate student, master's student in LRES, and um, has also traveled around the world, including going to New Zealand as part of our PIRE project. So I turn it over. Okay, well, first of all, oops, um, we are not going to stand up, sorry. We are going to be we sitting to down through the mic microphone now. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, well, so first of all, I want to thank um, Kathy Whitlock and the Institute of Ecosystems and uh, all of the folks that helped us in uh, learning. And I have to thank mainly Cliff Montaigne and Jason Baldus and Sierra Alexander, who is up front doing our timing today, and um, my students and colleagues, and Jared Hoy and uh, Matt Burgess, and all of them, including my husband in the back there. Um, so I want to thank you for our um, our grant that we have, the incubation grant, as well as um, the internship that Greta Robeson had last summer. All right, so I'm going to propose that we have ended the reductionist period of higher education or of academia that began perhaps in the 1400s with Francis Bacon when things began to be divided into these discipline boxes. I'm just going to stand up for a moment because I don't have a table in front of me. Um, and so we proposed that with these individual disciplines that ended up being silos in the way, um, you know, our uh, current model of higher education is uh, being used right now, we've proposed, all of us here that I've mentioned, have proposed a new university where these silos go in, they're somewhere here, but they have little boxes inside of them now too that are the individual subspecialties. But we come into this kind of thinking through doors. We might come in through uh, soil science, or we might come in through psychology, or through language arts, or through history. But it doesn't matter. When we get outside, we focus on the problem. And so that is what we're proposing. It's a new university. And we're proposing that this has to happen, because um, we have to be able to survive Western culture's current views of progress. Cliff. We live in one Earth, and we could think of that as a nested human ecological system. And we could look around at the various disciplines and see the, the trend towards combining disciplines in multidisciplinary ways under the umbrella of systems thinking, and realize, again, that we have many parts that make up systems, and we have synergies, either positive or negative, between the parts and the processes of operation of the so-called system. And then we have effects or outputs. And if we monitor those effects or outputs and use them as a feedback loop, then we have more or less a complete integrated systems approach. And that's a way to bring the individual disciplinary boxes together into the larger division of the larger whole. So if we think about our universities, we originally set those up to work in individual boxes. And now we realize that the individual boxes allow the reductionist approach that has given us great gains in fundamental knowledge, but often lacks an understanding of what the effects are of applying the tools developed by the reductionist approach. So if we step back and look at a way to holistically evaluate the effects of the tools we use, 
we get back into this whole systems approach. So our university could become more effective by helping faculty, staff, students to understand the greater whole that we're operating in, take advantage of the feedback loop, and work more closely to spend the time to engage with the other disciplines and see the synergies that come from combining together. So uh, myself, as a native scientist, uh, I have to build upon my predecessors, and that is the Native American communities where I come from on the Wind River Reservation, uh, the Shoshone and Arapaho people, but then also the scholar, scholarly people that are uh, at the forefront of Native science today, people like uh, Brian Deloria Jr. and Gregory Cajete, Robin Kimmer, uh, Black Elk, uh, standing, standing um, up for um, indigenous peoples who are currently fighting for our rights and, and such. But the uh, you know Native American science scientists have to be accepted, and uh, Native science has to be for and by the people that uh, are being affected by the communities. So Kehete he reminds us that the concept of Native science has the underlying philosophy of rash, uh, relationality that we're all related, that everything is related, and that this philosophy uh, has to do with our surroundings and the people that we are involved with. Shoshone say, Ba-na-na-shunte, or water is life, that water is, we're all made of water, everything has to depend upon water. The, Lako the Lakota people have a saying, which is all my relations. Dr. Dan Wildcat, another state, a fundamental difference between Western thought and Native thought is that indigenous knowledge is usually expressed as spatial, while Western knowledge, with a few exceptions such as landscape ecology, has a more temporal orientation. Indigenous peoples react in terms of relationships and community rather than individuality. Amazonian and other South American Native tribes right now are undergoing, undergoing bombardment. Um, one spokesman states, initiatives for, for protecting the environment are considered from a technical standpoint, which is what technical experts have studied. And that's fine that they've studied that, but they make a serious mistake by excluding traditional ways of respecting nature. Storytelling is the key to linking traditional ecological knowledge with Western scientific thinking. There's a series of stories told by a father who learned from his father and from them that you shouldn't go to certain places. It's a way of establishing a relationship of respect with the way resources are used. The important thing is the power of story. It's a way of transmitting rules about behaviors and attitudes and norms of relationships between communities and places like lakes and mountains and spiritual places to ensure that there is abundance for future generations. Story is a reservoir. Western science tends to take away from the community, especially native communities, rather than giving back. OK, so how does Western science work? This is kind of going to be biology 101 here. But it starts from a short <coughs> observation, usually, um, a question asking, and then, of course, a hypothesis generation in a non-judgmental atmosphere. And then comes an experimental protocol, which is pretty detailed. And then comes the experiment itself. And then comes the result. And the either rejection or the acceptance of the hypothesis. But the idea is to negate the hypothesis. OK. Um, then, of course, the truth is determined by the experimental procedure. And the experiment is repeated at least two more times, so a total of three. Now, um, the process, the next step, next slide. Uh, the process of knowing, we, we're thinking collectively here, usually starts, we've noticed, with native science. And then it proceeds to Western science. So let's take a look at a couple of things. Let's look, first of all, at technology. I'm wearing a very important traditional wisdom. Anybody know what it is? Technology? What am I wearing? 
I'm wearing infix fit. How did it become a thing to wear in public? Silk. Silk. Okay, 4,000 years mm -hmm. ago, that technology was developed, right? And it was a native science. It was a native process. It was a traditional ecological knowledge so bad if you passed it on to someone outside the royal family in China. Yeah. So um, another one I look at is shea butter extraction. You all use shea butter, I think, and it's also eaten. But that was a traditional te technology that was passed on, and we use it. Indian hemp, some of the best rope. Uh, that's not very degradable. And I brought with me one of my favorite ones. See if we can break that. Maybe we break one off. This is a toothbrush. Um, okay, if you take about a stick this size and you put it in your mouth, get it wet. And I'm not sure I would suggest, but you see there's little bristles. These automatically deliver antimicrobials that have been proven in Western science to kill dental caries, which is a bacteria, okay? And don't rush out here to the patent office or do a patent, because this is traditional knowledge. And this has reoccurred many times in uh, India with Azadiracta indica, the neem tree branches. This is from uh, the village where I work in Mali, and it's a different species. Um, and I think the Eastern Shoshone use cow parsnip. Um, all right. Uh, looking on, there's a lot of traditional um, medicines and nutraceuticals. Uh, just name a few. Uh, Artemisia tridentata vastiana, which grows most of this part of Montana, um, is used for many things. We can talk about this later. Tajides menuda, Mexican marigold. Um, name a few. Neat yarrow. Neem, of course, and echinacea, those all started with a native science process and ended up being uh, used, proven useful by Western science. So the knowing process, we have to remember, doesn't often start in a normal way in, and often doesn't come from normal sources. And uh, this is a video which some of you may have watched to get yourself ready to have this two-minute response. We're going to watch a five-minute video about Native science and uh, worldviews and Western worldviews. And then we're going to give you a two-minute response for questions. Are you talking about Chrome? Chrome? Yeah. And we'll have, we're having ten minutes at the end of this presentation or more for talk, but this just could be two minutes at the end. How we see the world determines how we act. The Western philosopher Hobbes saw humans as engaged in a war with each other over resources, making our lives solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. This view of the individual, fearful, working alone, in competition with others, now dominates Western philosophical tradition. In indigenous philosophy, we are all related as individuals, as part of a kinship-based community, and as part of nature, in balance with the whole. In most Western thought, society is seen as an aggregate of self-interested individuals, connected by competition with each other over limited resources, creating fear, insecurity, hopelessness, a scarcity of spirit. Indigenous societies see prosperity in nature. Resources are abundant, shared. Collaboration fosters environmental stewardship and balance with nature. In the Western worldview, nature is feared, its value based on hierarchy. Everything on Earth ranked, mineral, plant, animal. 
with humans at the top, dominating everything below. In the indigenous worldview, humans are an equal part of a vibrant, interconnected whole. Two worldviews, two very different economic systems. The dominant Western market economy, like its worldview, driven by an assumption of scarce resources, intensive centralized production, individuals with insatiable appetites, accumulating. By this standard, the market economy works. 40% of the Earth's resources owned by just 1% of the population. The combined wealth of the three richest individuals in the world exceeds the GDP of the poorest 47 countries. The world contains only 497 multi-billionaires, while half of its population survives on less than two and a half dollars a day. The indigenous economy, like its worldview, interdependent, decentralized production, extensive use of resources, promoting responsible resource management, abundance, kinship, a belief in enoughness, encourages sharing and cooperation. In the Arctic, after a successful whale hunt, Inuit kinship and reciprocal obligations ensure everyone's needs are met, fairly and equitably. Prerequisites for sustainability, the health of the economy measured by the health of the whole. Health in the market economy, measured by gross domestic product. The more we produce, consume, the better the economy. Construction of buildings, manufacturing, transportation, all considered positive production, but so is production of weapons, cigarettes, while investments like health care, education, are considered costs, negative economic productivity. And the impact on GDP of the physical and emotional costs of warfare? or the pollution that threatens one-third of the world's animal species? Irrelevant externalities outside the system. Not even making it onto the balance sheet. An unsustainable system where scarcity of resources is a self-fulfilling prophecy. There is an alternative. Indigenous people's territory spans 24% of the Earth's land surface but is home to 80% of its total biodiversity. This is not a coincidence. In indigenous cultures, balance and harmony aren't romantic notions, but millennia-old design fundamentals. Nature essential for survival, production and protection together, economic success sustainable, creating well-being for all. First Peoples funds indigenous models and traditional practices that offer insight to creating an alternative economy. So, uh, we'll take two minutes. Um, what message does this give, give you? And, or what message for teaching, research, and outreach? We're just interested in your, what you think. Well, I'm wondering. Do you believe in a commonality of, of philosophy between Africa, Australia, North America, among the indigenous peoples? Uh, do we have such a commonality? I, I don't know. I, I believe we do. Um, in experiences uh, with other indigenous cultures, for instance, the Maori in New Zealand, the uh, Altai people in Central Russia, the Native American people in North America, South America, Alaska Natives, Canadian Natives. This is a universal um, theme that we find uh, worldwide amongst indigenous people. Thank you. Yes. My name is uh, Elizabeth Rank, and I work in the 
Zealand on a really small island uh, towards the uh, North Pole. And um, they do the traditional whale hunting there. And I just want to comment on, you know, doing research with the hunters there and looking at the changes in the map. And, um, their traditional way of sharing the meat, the whale meat, is still very much intact. But because of the quota systems around whale, narwhal hunting and the changes that the kind of the, the world confederation around hunting is not quite the right word. I mean, it's pretty tragic how they're kind of butting up against each other. And one of the um, issues that the hunters will talk about a lot is that Traditionally, they would all, as hunters, they would all come together to talk about how the hunt was going to go each season, and that they would agree before they went out on the water what that hunt was going to look like and who was going to be the main hunters and, and who was going to be the support. And that now, because of the quota system and the pressure of the economy to make money, because they can't make money anymore whale hunting, they fight out on the water and there are starting to be accidents out on the water with the hunters. So just to reflect that, you know, this idea of a Western economy coming into an indigenous culture, um, you know, it, it is still, still an active and palpable and having lots of ramifications around um, the way of I would say that the underlying philosophy is similar amongst indigenous people, but the, in, the impact from Western ideologies have affected all native people. Uh, there's very few isolated populations that exist who can have the, those underlying philosophies intact without the ramifications of, of the Western world. But the, the underlying philosophy is what we're, what we're really looking at. We as indigenous people in Wyoming are affected by oil and gas development. All of us are affected by uh, our, our need for natural resource extraction. Um, you know, the, the, the buffalo economy is gone. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're trying to bring back elements of these types of things for cultural revitali revitalization and restoration. But it's the underlying philosophy that we have to have in order to do that. Do we have, how much time do we have? Two minutes. Okay. Um, <coughs> yes. Yeah. We, we kind of like, we're going to have a 10 minute at the end, so um, we'll have time for all the other comments then. Um, all right. So now we want to shift to maybe the heart of the seminar, which is adaptation and resilience to climate change. And uh, to begin this part, uh, with the next slide. Um, Actually, the next one, and then we'll have to go back. Uh, <laughs> in there. Um, is, uh, one of the bar graphs, that one. Good. Um, so what I did, just to give me an understanding of what's happening with TEK, with traditional ecological knowledge, we're going to refer to as TEK. Um, so I took uh, one of the seminal articles that we all considered was important, which was Huntington in the year 2000, published in Ecological ap um, Applications. And I looked at the other uh, articles that were produced in that time, and then uh, what, when and what was the content of the 228 articles that cited his work in the past 15 years. And it was amazing to me, maybe not to you, but what I found, as you can see on this chart, the years are at the bottom and the number of citations at the top is there's not much happening in um, uh, recognizing this article, which talked about the ways of accumulating or the ways of using um, in an experimental process uh, traditional ecological knowledge, um, such as in-depth uh, directed interviews and surveys, and pieces. there were four different types. And he looked at both, uh, he looked at herring and whales um, and uh, one other uh, marine mammal. But you can see there's a big jump. And there is something positive happening. It's 
definitely a trend upwards. And if I extrapolate from the data in these first two months of how many articles were um, recognizing Huntington, uh, it, there's a big jump and there's something positive happening right now. And so uh, I think my colleagues are going to uh, direct our attention to uh, other um, ways of using PEK. In, in this particular article, there was a big difference between the traditional ways of assessing populations of these marine mammals and the Western scientific ways. There was maybe uh, almost a 50% <laughs> difference in assessing just populations. Well, uh, this particular part of the presentation is centered kind of around Yellowstone and how uh, TEK can be uh, referred to uh, in peer-referred peer -refer refer journals. Uh, and the fact is that there isn't very many. Um, the, United, the, the Montana State University recognizes 22 non-resident tribes and as well as 12 in-resident tribes that have ties to Yellowstone. Uh, my tribe, the Eastern Shoshone, one of them. But very little uh, Western science utilizes the traditional ecological knowledge of any of those tribes when it comes to Yellowstone. And my particular work has been kind of around buffalo or, or bison restoration uh, and, and its role in the, in the Great Plains. And you know, Native people have known for a long time that biodiversity will increase just with the presence of buffalo. And my friends up at Fort Peck uh, have been seeing the effects of this. Uh, they've been able to restore Yellowstone bison to large portions of their lands. And they are seeing uh, plant biodiversity go, go up. And because bison primarily feed on graminoids, then the food plants increase, which are forb species. But then also other species are increasing as well, like uh, birds. So as a keystone species, Bison or buffalo is very important to biodiversity. So mountain plovers, ferruginous hawks, burrowing owls, uh, those are all listed as species of concern by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Those, no, those birds are, are reappearing. And so that is an instance where uh, we have a direct relationship with Yellowstone, Yellowstone buffalo, but also Native American tribes in establishing what we've already known for, for quite some time. Uh, that's just one, one instance, but uh, Cliff, did you have how's the times here? We need to move on. Nope. Okay. Stepping back because we don't find a lot of published peer-reviewed information about tra traditional ecological knowledge in Yellowstone. I find that there's a lot more literature coming from Canada, and the scientist Berkeys at the University of Manitoba is one of the most productive of those. An article in 2010 Ecological Applications talking about the role of TEK as so-called adaptive management is a foundation. For me, it rings a bell with Bruce Maxwell's use of the term adaptive management. And that particular article looks at a number of indigenous systems, mostly in North America, but also in Africa and Asia and shows how they are using the tools of, for example, thinning forests in ways to achieve particular age class objectives or, or thinning age classes of fishery member, fish, of fish to achieve results that would be more sustainable in terms of a long-term population that also produces a harvest. Or moving cattle around in Africa to follow the seasons of green. So Berkey cites these examples and shows how they seem to make sense ecologically. Then he looks at the social systems behind the decision making for those processes, and then looks at the institutions that are evolving to support those social systems. So that we see, a, let's say, an improvement in the capacities of humans to think and use this process of systems thinking or adaptive management. And then there's really a conclusion that TEK is eventually going to be shared by all cultures. 
and that all of us are indigenous to the earth, and therefore we all have opportunities and responsibilities to contribute to this decision making. The other one, rather quickly, by Nancy Turner in Ecology and Society in 2013, looks with detail at what, what's going on in the British Columbia coastal tribes and their fisheries and their forestry in terms of climate change. And again, it shows some of the systems of understanding history of climate change and how those communities have adapted by moving or changing their practices as the climate conditions in past time have varied rather quickly. So we see examples of the resilience that is gained by being able to adapt to change. So those were two for me that I think set the stage for what we need to do in the Greater Yellowstone. Thank you. Sierra, do we have moments left? Yeah. I want to take one moment, actually. Um, I wanted to look at all these 228 articles uh, referencing Huntington's TEK article 2000. None of them included the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem or the Crown of the Continent. And um, however, there are articles or there are pieces of research from MSU students that may get into the literature in some time to come. So I wanted to point those out very quickly because the students are here. Uh, Greta Robeson um, it initiated a study with the Absaoka, or the Absaoka initiated the study, I'm sorry. And uh, when they heard about uh, Greta having some background in GIS, um, engaged her in helping them understand uh, a piece of um, traditional practice, but also very related to their nutrition, which is the four uh, main berries that they um, <coughs> like to collect as a family um, in strengthening elder youth connections and also providing a very excellent source of vitamin C and other antioxidants. And this is Greta's poet, one of Greta's several posters, and you can look at that later. Uh, this was followed on by, if we could go backward or forward, um, Jared Hoy is over here. Greta is in the back over there. You can talk with her. And this is Jared, uh, also uh, followed on with um, the Absalica's request to have a, um, a website that would capture some of this information and engage the youth in uh, uh, knowing what was happening in Lodge, particularly where this a uh, project called Let's Pick Berries was uh, focused. And one more comment, uh, I want to say that uh, how traditional ecological knowledge can also be developed and is being developed as we speak by uh, Western culture folks and uh, farmers such as Bob, who uh, farms here in this valley, and Matt Burgess, uh, all know that our Growing season has extended, but there's also some odd climatic things. And so uh, Matt with his town's harvest and Bob with his family garden have to adjust to those, and they're doing it. OK. Um, now, we're going to go back on time, I hope, here. We have um, produced, the three of us and others have produced a video that um, is a way of or it just represents one small way that we met, um, that, that we were able to capture some um, conversations of elders from both the Black Sea and the Eastern Shoshone. And I wonder if we even have time for that. Shall we? I think we're going to be OK. The large scale broad impact of this project is that the model we propose for creating a research team using both traditional ecological knowledge and western scientific ways of knowing could serve as a model for all climate change research. Understanding and valuing various dimensions of traditional wisdom and incorporating its spirit into policies based on both 
ecological knowledge and Western science could improve the chances of mitigating destructive impacts of climate change. Traditional ecological knowledge directly influences the state of mind, which influences the state of society, and which in turn influences the state of the environment. One thing I noticed was our weather, we used to get snow. I got way up here, almost past the top of our cars. We'd have to shovel mm -hmm. to go get water, to go any place. There's a lot of changes. I yes. feel like civilization has yes. said it all, you know. They say uh, construction, but to me it's obstruction. <laughs> uh, I mean, it just bugs me to see them uh, a plow field clear up into the mountains, you know, because to me that affects the food for the animals. But they go up as high as they can on dry farming and everything. I don't know. I just... I just feel like it's destruction, but and it's all for money, you know. I don't feel like um, like Mother Nature is not is just being destroyed. Mm -hmm. the, it seems like there may not be a value place on the way things are naturally. That there's an This is, I think, a 15 to 20 minute film, and it is on the um, IOE website. And it has some very interesting parts to it that I think you would enjoy the conversation. Yeah. So we're going to go on now at this point and look at, so, so we understand this is important. How do we the traditional voice in, or the native voice? in our research at Teaching and our Outreach. There are four points that I'd like to share and then uh, is that Cliff and I have really worked out together. And then Jason will uh, close with his statements about that. I first of all say you have to visit. You have to visit in an immersion way. You have to go. You have to stay overnight. And stay more than one night. <coughs> And when you pack to go, don't take an agenda with you. No agenda. No agenda except maybe to listen or to learn. And in order to learn other ways of knowing and that kind of knowledge, one is to listen. And that means not talking. It's really hard for us to do. It's really hard. I understand. And in that when that listening period comes to a point when you feel ready to ask a question, remember there's another waiting period. When you ask a question, it's important in some Native American cultures to wait. And for a Western culture person, it's waiting until you're really uncomfortable. But that's important because these are all oral-based cultures. Waiting for an answer. Waiting for an answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because these are oral-based cultures, we have to always remember that the spoken word is very important. The written word is not. It's much, much more minor. And so um, my, um, I want to first hear to my, uh, my students' um, honors thesis. And uh, although this was data collected in my class, by me and other um, students, and Greta is the one that put it together in this format, and I'm going to be actually reading her conclusions. Um, I think what's very important to note, we looked at a hundred and uh, over a hundred students, and from uh, three classes in the College of Ag and one in the College of uh, Letters and Science. And uh, what we found is that 
um, the students working over here on the right hand side, um, students basically outside of the AG. C 465R class, which is Health, Poverty, Agriculture, Concepts, and Action Research, most of them had not experienced traditional ecological knowledge in the classroom. And when you look at the time frame, uh, longitudinally over the three years that we particularly looked, uh, there was a nice steady increase of about 50% of students who reported some beneficial um, uh, response to learning about TEK, and then we noticed that there was kind of a jump in 2012. And uh, Greta pointed out to me that this is the time at which the teaching assistants and most all of the co-instructors were non-Western culture students. And so um, I think that's another thing for us to remember. Let's do the next slide, Jason. And this is perhaps the most telling, is what did these students perceive was the attitude of other, well, of Western science, of their other professors, in um, recognizing the importance of TEK. And that's on the left-hand side. It's over on your left. Um, so they perceived that most all of the formal scientific community did not, uh, were not too positive about it. And on the right-hand side, this pie graph uh, shows us almost the opposite, which is that the students, these are the millennial generation students, they do understand that there's an important relationship between formal Western science and TEK. And so, I'd just like to read very quickly, and I'm going to quote um, Greta. And this is um, student views on TEK in the academic and the scientific community. With only 24% of students having encountered TEK before in the classroom, it is interesting to note that 85% of students see a connection between TEK and formal scientific knowledge. This means that though over three quarters of students believe that TEK is related to science, and indeed a majority of them benefit from it in the classroom, less than one quarter of students had encountered the concept before this particular class, 465R. It is not surprising, considering this information, that when students were asked how to integrate TEK, 30% of them explicitly stated they wanted more classes like this and more professors willing to lead classes like this. And so I guess that's what we're trying to encourage. Um, one note is that these students, which now I think there's been about 225, 230 students, when they have the moment of taking the visit to the reservation in an immersion way a couple of nights over in staying on the Anselica and the Northern Cheyenne. Um, most all of them that are Western culture folks or non-Native American have never been on a reservation. And so this is a very scary statistic, or very interesting one mm -hmm. to me, but it seems to be something that needs to be changed. And this is the model for how the course works. There's a community which gives the students the direction for what kind of research they're going to do in this university core research and creative activities class. So um, I think we should move on. And now, Jason, uh, help us understand how to reach out. Well, we live in Montana, and there are seven reservations in the state. Um, I come from a state in Wyoming where there's only one reservation. There is a lot of politics that goes in uh, in a state that doesn't recognize or acknowledge the Native Americans that live in that state. Wyoming politically oftentimes is cowboys and Indians. I came to Montana because of the, the fact that the state government reaches out to the Native Americans in this state. So when I come to a university and I became involved with Florence's class, uh, you get a real understanding of people who don't really know about reservations, don't know how to work with Indian people. 
don't understand our morals and beliefs and philosophies. I don't know of another class that requires students to go to the reservation, but through the many uh, classes that I've been able to help with in her class, there is a transformative process that happens to students when they are submersed into uh, our reservation cultures. So when the students go to the reservation, uh, they interact with uh, scholars, interact with students from their tribal colleges. Um, there's something that happens inside. Um, and that is the very point that I tried to make to begin with, and that's relationality. When you build a relationship with the community, then you have a broad understanding, you have a, a connection, then that changes your worldview. And so I encourage uh, you all to step out of your comfort zone if you're interested in working or understanding, working with Native people, to go uh, submerge yourself in the community. We have lots of cultural events throughout the summer, throughout Indian country. Seven reservations, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, South Dakota, North Dakota. Indian country is, is, is large and broad, and there's always events that are open to the community. That's how you connect. That's how you reach out. You go to those places and you learn. You develop those those relationships that uh, you often don't don't get if you don't go there. When I was growing up, my father always told me to have the three P's: uh, patience, perseverance, and persistence. And uh, it took me a long time to really understood what that mean, what that meant, but. They speak for themselves. I was a part of an organization called Native American Fish and Wildlife Society where we worked with youth uh, from all over Indian country. And we had the uh, seven R's is what we said. And these seven R's uh, re reflect who, who you are as a person and our virtues that we have throughout Indian country. Respect is the number one. Respect for others, respect for your community, respect for all living things. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to our community and to our planet that we do things. We keep these relationships strong and relationships with each other and to the community and to the landscape in which we live. And you always give back through reciprocity. If you take something, you give back. And there's a reason for everything. Everything happens for a reason. We're all here in this room for a reason. And then we restore things that are taken away from us, our languages, our culture. We restore the balance that's in nature that's been taken away. And then we become resilient. And having resiliency allows us to continue into the future uh, to um, be good human beings. So the take home message is involve yourself, immerse, and interact. And I promise you, you will learn. I also encourage you to participate in the Native Science Fellows Gathering this, this Friday, sponsored by Hopa Mountain. You'll be able to learn, uh, listen to people like Gail Small of the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, as well as Dr. Leroy Little Bear from the Small Robes Band of the Blood Tribe of the Blackfeet Confederacy. Uh, this Friday at the Procrastinator Theater, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to learn from other Native American scholars and, and their in their own work as well. Thank you, Jason. And I would invite you to come to lunch on Friday in the middle of that wonderful day uh, to another piece of traditional knowledge, ecological knowledge, uh, the bug buffet. And uh, you'll be able to taste some uh, very interesting things from around the world, but um, they're all approved by our food safety officer, and um, you'll look at, you'll hear some entrepreneurial um, uh, successes. You'll hear about those. But the important thing there is to understand that um, although Western culture experience is a disgust factor with that one piece of our food system, that it has caused on the other side among Native people an embarrassment factor. So they've taken away, they've abandoned some of their use of this very important protein source. And so as an entomologist, I'm particularly embarrassed about that. I, I'm happy about that. But th this is 
is another example of um, how important the Western attitude of scientists um, of all of us are. And so we come to the moment of saying um, the take home message we hope is to just begin and get started and continue. And now we give you nine minutes of just your comments. Do you want to start back here? Are you okay? All right. Oh, okay. So. I, I hate to be a pig asking too many questions. Um, you, uh, I, I see two things here that I'm not going to straighten my mind. One is you described the process for doing science, the process of the Western. So we make an observation, we make a hypothesis, we test it, we do a series of those, we develop a theory. So uh, I don't want you to answer this right now, but, uh, but could you make a similar statement about how native, uh, about how uh, traditional ecological science does its work? That's my, my first thought. Is that I haven't got that in my mind is how you develop traditional science. Okay. And then my question, it seems to me you have sort of contrasted the process of, of science, of, of, divis, of analytical science, with the uh, results on the native side, on the traditional side, that there is a traditional it seems to me that there is a, so we say, a non-traditional knowledge that's developed by this other. Uh, and so there, there are two sides to that that I have a little difficulty in, in uh, making a, a two-by-two two table to analyze them with. Okay, and then uh, I'll just do one tiny thing about traditional science, and about traditional knowledge, and that is I worked on a farm in Italy in 1961, and I saw some stupid things being done, really stupid things being done, and I said so. And they said, well, let's just take a closer look, and I listened. That's what you asked me to do. And they were right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm going to say I think that those farmers, and probably many Montana ranchers, have developed a traditional knowledge too, and not by that type analytical method. For what it's worth, I'm just not going to say anything. <laughs> well, Berkey's would show the the process of adaptive management as a science process of making a decision to try something and trying it again and again and again, and learning each time you try it. So, so, so to me, that's another form of science. Also, Savory and Butterfield, who created a holistic process, is similar to a, a native or traditional type of knowledge in that you uh, approach farming or ranching in a holistic way, then you, you ultimately benefit everybody because of the, that, that model. And, and I think uh, I like the Italian farmer uh, concept, but and also other more industrial farmers, thinking about the whole. And that's what I see is really missing. It's the wholeness. And, and a lot of these mistakes come from that lack of understanding what is the whole. I do ask me to be quiet, but I've got to ask one question. The two by two matrix is Western thinking. Get off of that track. <laughs> Exactly what's wrong. No, that's what that's I'm what's afraid. wrong. That's not what's afraid. going on. The two by two matrix is the Western thinking. And you know that you trust my intelligence. You know I'm right. You and I know it. And that what works for one place might not work for another place. What works in one area might not work for another area. Well, can you teach me? Put buffalo back. Put buffalo back. <laughs> Things will get better. <laughs> Take away Roundup. Yeah. I have a question.
question about the pie chart. Can you be sure and turn your speaker on oh, so that, I didn't do that the audience at large can share? I have a question about the pie chart. Mm -hmm. And um, one, of the, one of the charts talked about connections students saw between TEK and more formal science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm wondering what those connections might be that the students saw. <laughs> Okay, well, we have two other students, three other students here, four. <laughs> um, Greta, do you want to uh, respond first since that's your data summary? Um, well, so these were taken from a survey that was given at the end of the classes, and students went through, and the specific question asked, do you see a relationship? And the response was yes or no. So I'd say most of the people just said that, yes, I do see one, and they weren't asked to elaborate on it. So I can't speak for all of the students. But I would say that the connection that was brought up most and probably the connection that I see most is that Western, the Western scientific way of thinking can often feel like once you're exposed to the more holistic way of thinking is just a piece of it. And then you start to see how it's connected to things that you don't think your discipline is even connected to, like I do GIS work. And you see how it's connected to community health, connected to, and it gives your work so much more gravity. Uh, because you see that it's part of a larger system. So I, for me personally, that was it, but I can't speak for all the students because mostly the responses were either yes, I see a connection, or no, and then like a quick sort of yes, this should be integrated. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Jared, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, I'll just say that like uh, <coughs> you kind of see that TEK can influence Western scientists and the other way around, Western science can give insights to TEK. You will have in your handout um, the diagram that we've been talking about, the holistic process and how we use it in a community. We'll get all these diagrams. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if we have here, um, I guess I feel like we have maybe a little bit of a, a caricature of Western science that unfortunately maybe is um, strengthened by Western popular media, where the, the notion that, that I have as a scientist that I'm pretty attached to my reductionist way of thinking actually, and, um, but I don't pretend that any individual answer that I arrive at by that method solves all of the world's problems. And you might feel like you could make a lot of money on internet clicks by writing a headline that would suggest that, but that's not the way I feel about my results. I, I think that they're applicable to this particular situation, and I want people to understand how their situation might differ from that, and not so much take my results, but maybe some underlying relationship that I've teased out by that method, more important than the particular result. But we don't do that um, in, I guess I'd, I'd say the media world where scientific results are, are made popular to you know the, uh, society as a whole. I think that's one of the breakdowns of Western science is the interpretation and by politicians, by everybody. Thoughts? So almost every media outlet calls attention to a particular tool but forgets to think about the broader ramifications of the application of that tool. It, it's almost like couples counseling, you know, where <laughs> the, um, you know, the woman is as, as important as the man, and they need to be thought of as a team. And maybe that's what we need to think about is uh, native science is an important process. Western science is an important process. It gives you information on a specific thing and, and in a specific condition and together that's very helpful it's the togetherness we have to think about that. and that can lead to the positive synergies we need so, yes uh -huh. there is a movement primarily in Canada to only have indigenous scholars and indigenous researchers do indigenous research Mm -hmm. and a movement to only fund indigenous researchers to, to do that research and really 
kind of not and not involve um, white Western classic kind of research methodology mm -hmm. or white researchers, for lack of a better way to describe us. Um, I'm curious about your philosophy about that, your position, or what kind of response you would have to that approach. Because I, you know, I not only do I work in Greenland, but I also work up at Fort Peck, and sometimes I run into that um, very kind of dogmatic view of science. I, w I would say that that is a result of the relationship or lack thereof between federal government and Native American or First Nations people, that uh, there's been so many atrocities that have occurred through land grabbing, um, cultural genocide, language uh, discouragement, boarding school era, that that's fed into the educational system where we don't want to, we don't want to share information because you're not going to use it in the right way or you're going to take more from us. And so then that's a, uh, that's a protective mechanism to hold on to our valuable knowledge that we have. I think that uh, there's elements that should be protected like that, but in the bigger whole scheme of things, we're all here together. Uh, we're all on the same planet, and we should be able to share and learn from one another, but personal opinion. I think we have oh, to end. Yeah, Jason, Lawrence. Thank you for a very uh, provocative and interesting presentation. I really appreciate the way you brought it all. Thank you.